Hello, Jimmy. Yeah, well, welcome, everyone, to another Q&A Live. We've decided to carry them on for at least another week, so I'm very excited to introduce Professor Alex uh, Rulin from the universe. Uh, how do I pronounce it? Lausanne? Lausanne? L Lausanne, yes. Lausanne. Lausanne. <laughs> yes, the French-speaking part. I did, I did try and look at it on YouTube and there was a, a, a one minute video of how to pronounce it and I, I still didn't get it right. <laughs> so <laughs> normally, Alex, what I do is just sort of hand it over to you and I'll just ask the odd question. I'm, I'm really excited to speak to you. I know I've not, we've not spoke before other than me sending you some emails about the new book, which we'll talk about a bit, a bit later on. And then if I get any questions, I'll try and keep an eye on Facebook and see whether any, any questions come in. Um, I'll just scroll down so I can see if any come in. Um, yeah, so tell us tell us a bit about you then and, and your work at the university first, go on. Okay, first I'm fond of birds since I'm seven years old. And when I was 10, uh, I was telling to my professor the, that I wanted to be an ornithologist when I would be big, a big boy. Yeah. And uh, that's what I did. And I studied in Bern. And then I came in the UK, in uh, Cambridge for oh, yeah. a few, few years, yes. Still always working with a barn owl, always. And now I'm a professor since 2004 uh, in Lausanne. That's 15 years, about 16 years. And my uh, entire research group is working exclusively on the barn owl. We did some work on Tony owls as well during 10 years, but now we stopped and we were working on the barn owl. And wh wh why I'm so obsessed by the barn owl? It's not because this is my preferred animal, but because I really think uh, I'm really totally convinced myself. I hope, I'm not sure that everybody will be convinced, but it's so uh, so fantastic bird, so interesting that even I have 10 people and these 10 people can work every day just on the barn owl. There are so many questions to answer. Just this is my life, I'm 52. And uh, yeah, I dedicate my life in the raptor research and conservation, fundamental research, education, all these things. What did you so going back to let's go back to Cambridge quickly then? What did you do? What what were you over here with the university? What part of that was? Yeah, what why, why Cambridge? Mm. That's the question. Because this is in the UK, I wanted to come in the UK, and this is a very good university to understand why this is so famous. That's I learned a lot. But the main the main reason that's because I was working on the field of uh, family interactions between family members. And the banal is very special because the chicks, they vocalize all night long in the absence and presence of the parents. You know, usually the, the sparrows, they just beg when the parents arrive at the nest and otherwise they stay silent, not the banal. They talk all night long. Each chick can produce up to 5,000 calls, you know, just in the absence of the parents, crazy. Wow. And uh, I did some uh, work in the field to understand what, why they do this. In fact, they discuss, the chicks, the siblings discuss. And this resolved the, the, the conflict there for uh, who will get the next prey, you know? Instead of fighting, they discuss, okay, that's for you, after you, my friend. If it, it takes the prey and then we continue to talk with the other siblings and they solve the problem. And what I wanted to do in Cambridge, this was to produce a mathematical model of this hypothesis, that, which I called sibling negotiation. And we yeah. did the mathematical model of this to prove that this is, from a mathematical point of view, uh, realistic. And this is realistic. This was my goal. And we That's did fantastic. it. Fantastic. Who? Yeah. So just just out of interest, who were you doing? Who was that? Who were you doing that with? Uh, Barnow conservationists in the UK. Who who was? Who... No, 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 no. I, I was doing my field work in Switzerland. Ah, okay. But, okay. But, yeah, yeah. Always coming back to my study area. But in, in Cambridge, I was working with, with a mathematician. His name is Rufus Johnstone. Okay. He's yeah. a very, very clever guy. Yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> Much clever yeah. than me. <laughs> you, you, well, you only have to mention Cambridge, and I think, yeah, that's out of my league. That's, the <laughs> that's yeah. it. So just, I, I, I'm going to keep coming up with questions, I can tell. So apologies if anyone else asks a question, I'll try and get to it. Now, I'll, in, in, in the UK, um, in Britain, you may have experienced this, I'd say barn owls are probably the most heavily monitored raptor 
in the UK, I'd have thought so. I mean, so if we take my the county that I'm from, Cheshire, I think in Cheshire is a I, I don't know the square mile or kilometers of Cheshire, but there's at least five individual barn owl groups covering the whole of you know it's split up into segments. So it's brilliant. Cheshire's a really good county for for barn owl monitoring, um, and. Anyway, one of, one of the things that I think shocked Pete, the general public was we've got a TV programme that's actually due to come on TV called Spring Watch, and it, it involves nest boxes and, 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 and cameras and the watching the life cycle of, of, of these nests for, for the general public. And there was a barn owl nest on it one year. Now, I know, I know a bit about asynchronous hatching and how, you know, one barn owl chick is this big and, you know, going, going upwards almost like Russian dolls sort of things or going down. Uh, but it shocked the, the public one when this particular year they were filming this barn owl nest on the, on, live on national TV in Britain. And the, the food, I think the mail, I think something happened to the mail. So food became short. And the big chick ate the little chick and, and so on. And everyone was shocked. How does, with your, your work that you did on, on the chicks communicating with each other, saying essentially, this is your turn. When it, when sh is there a point where that goes out the window, so to speak, because food becomes so short that, well, it, it doesn't matter. I, I'm having this, I'm bigger. That makes sense. What, 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 what I would first say is that there is no siblicide in the banal. We don't kill each other mm -hmm. unless there is really no food at all. Yeah. But, but the, key, the key reason why we are not violent, that's because when mortality is the highest, the highest rate of mortality, that's when the chicks are relatively, relatively small. Okay. And when they are small, they have not the strength to kill. You know, they are, they are very weak. The, the, the last hatched chick, there is no food, they just die. I don't need to kill my brother. He will die, he will starve anyway. Yeah. They, they die by starving. And then they eat them, they cannibalize because nothing is lost. And later on, when they are bigger, when they have the strength to kill each other. In fact, they don't do this because they can cope with lack of food during one, two days. Because they, mm -hmm. they don't need to kill each other. And regarding negotiation, the, this discussion, when they call, uh, they, they discuss together. In fact, the biggest, he, he negotiates as well. You know, he's very strong. He could impose himself. Mm -hmm. But still, he negotiates. Why? Because the smallest are so motivated. They are so hungry. They are so motivated to get the food. They will fight for the food. Yeah. Yes, he prefers to know what if the smallest needs food or not. I say, okay, I don't want to fight with you. It's useless. Anyway, I wait for one hour. But of course, if there is no food, we will not wait. We'll get it. But if yeah. he can wait, he prefers not to fight. It's just useless. The, the, okay. the biggest one, he wants to hear what the, the smallest has to say, just to be sure he can get the food without fighting. Ah, so that, yeah, so that, well, it, it kind of, we'll talk about the whole conflict thing with barn owls helping humans in a bit, but it's almost like, yeah, barn owls are lovers, not fighters then, they're anti, anti-conflict. That's really, that's yeah. really interesting, because, yeah, right, the way, I mean, yeah. I've not re read too much into it, but when you, you, re you read about it, yeah, a lot of people lead you to believe that it's just nature, as soon as, as soon as the bigger chick is hungry, He's in his instinct, which obviously isn't true. And then his instinct yeah. isn't to eat the smaller one straight away. Yeah. But still, he, he eats more than the smallest because he's stronger. He can get. But once he has eaten what he wants, he starts to be nicer and he, he wants to discuss with the others. And yeah. I, can, I can tell you an anecdote because I'm working in, the, I don't know if you know this project in Israel, Palestine, mm. and Jordan. Yeah, with we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah we'll talk. Uh, but, but just the story, I was, I was mm. giving a talk in Tel Aviv. Half of the room were soldiers, and the other half were ecologists. And I was telling the, the, the audience, you know, many, many people, I said, well, listen, the barn owl is very nice. It's a peaceful bird, and we should take, you know, we should uh, uh, do the same as the barn owl. They don't. This is what I saw, I saw. This is a killing machine. They eat the rodents. They can kill the rodents a lot, very efficient. But they are very peaceful. 
they solve the problems without fighting. And this is a model for us. And at the end of the talk, I said, oh my God, what did I say <laughs> with all these soldiers? And they came to me and said, wow, fantastic message. And this is really great, you know? And people were really, um, they really loved the, the, this, this, this picture of the, the, the killing machine, which is peaceful. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's yeah right. That, that. Well, let's let's talk about that then, because I think that's the first before I actually knew who you were, <laughs> Alex. Um, the the that was um, yeah. There was a piece in I think it was the Guardian in our in our country. The Guardian did a piece on the barn owls and the work of them be the project um, that that you're involved with. That where barn owls yeah. are basically bringing a, a certain amount of peace to to parts yeah. of the Middle East. So tell us all about tell us all about that project. Yeah. Okay. This is it, which combines ecology and reconciliation between the communities. The the key thing is that the farmers they spread poison to kill the rodents. But this is not so good because the rodents, they don't die directly. They still roam above the ground. The raptors eat them. They accumulate the poison and they die. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. We convince the farmers to fix boxes for the barn owls instead of spraying uh, poison. But the, the ecological problem with the poison is not national. It's not only Israel. It's started in Israel. It's regional. Thus, we need to have the Palestinian friends and Jordanians with us. And that's why it started to become a uh, uh, project to bring people at the same table to talk about something which has nothing to do with the conflict and people you know they love each other they are really friends uh, we have to see when i saw this the first time i said wow i was, I was amazed and that's when i decided 10 years ago to a bit more to be involved in this project and because i'm swiss i'm neutral and it's true that when you are neutral and you are really neutral you know i don't have a, a specific idea in mind when you are really neutral they, they start to trust you and you can really uh, do a lot of things. And my role in this project, because I'm not living in the Middle East, but one of my role is to try to find money because we need to do field work, mainly in Palestine and Jordan. In Israel, yeah. there is more, more, more money. And to spread the word as I'm doing right now, like in The Guardian, you know, to, to tell this is a very nice story, it's very inspiring and people love it because this is not, we always talk about the conflict. Now we have something, you know, this is, brings hope. And that's when two years ago, um, even the president of Switzerland invited me to, to present the project to the entire diplomatic corps, 150 ambassadors. We showed yes. them the banals in Switzerland. My friends from the Middle East came. And even last year, I, I, I sent a letter to the Pope. I said, well, yeah. Well, I was and gonna then, ask you, I, I saw a picture of you with the Pope. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Tell, tell, yeah. Tell us about because that. yeah, because I noticed that I'm neutral, not only because I'm Swiss, because I'm a scientist. We are scientists, and also because I'm Christian. I realized this at some point. I'm neither a Jew nor a Arab, a Muslim. And then I, I thought, okay, I should write to the Pope. That's what I did. I went to the bishop, and I told him the story. He said, wow, it's fantastic. The Pope is coming in Geneva. Write me a letter. And we give the letter to him in his hands. And I can tell you he will answer. I said, okay, I, I, I wrote the letter. And one year later, it took one year. Why one year? Because they inquire about you, about my friends, who you are, you know, if you are a nice guy or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is a, if, this is a good thing to bring you in Vatican. And uh, it was the, on my birthday, on the 14th of March, I received an email from the Pope. I mean, the, the, the Supita said, so, yeah, you're invited on 11th of May. That's we went there. And it was really fantastic. Wow. It was uh, one of the biggest experiences we had in our life to, to meet this person who is really, really, well, it was um, a big, um, I can say, a lot of enthusiasm. He loved all the stories about the barn owls, about the migratory birds. He was really fascinated, really. Big eyes like this, you know, like a kid, yeah, if you yeah. want. He was, wow, you know this, we were telling him stories which is so different from the presidents. You know, they come, oh, he's Switzerland. Well, he's very good today. Oh, I'm very happy. Now we are talking about, about birds, about barn owls. And it really, it was refreshing for him. And the, the conflict is very, he talks to his heart as well. That's why he agreed that we, we, we go to, to invite us to the Vatican. 
That's, I mean, I, yeah, I, basically I was, I'd not seen these pictures till last night. I was looking for a nice <laughs> picture of you to put on Facebook to advertise this. And I, I was like, I had to look again. I was like, there's one of you. And I was like, that's the Pope or that's someone dressed like the Pope. And then there's another picture of you showing him a book, a book or some pictures or something of the, of the yeah, project. And the and I was like, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, yeah, I, I gave him the very first copy of the book on the Barnard published at Cambridge University Press. Cambridge made a specific copy for the Pope. Brilliant. <laughs> well, you would, would you? Yeah. That's I mean, the yeah, I mean, the Pope, and yeah, that's that's right up there. Really. <laughs> yeah. So what? Well, I mean, but it's it's true. I mean, in a really a completely inferior way, when I read that article from the guardian it stuck with me it, it stuck with me and and i and i did i i mean i, I have to admit i'm i am at, as i've mentioned to you in the previous emails i'm fascinated by the relationship between birds of prey and humans and cultures yep. um, and, mm -hmm. and how they link together but yeah it, it did stick with me and then obviously came the book so i saw that you've got your this new book out so we've kind of we've got to talk about the book um, yes. Tell us, remind us the color, the, what's it, the, the, remind us the title of the book. I, I should, I should take a copy of the book. Well, the yeah, I'll show us a copy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I don't remember the title, by the way. It's banal, anyway, for sure. Wait a second. Yeah, here. Evolution and ec ecology. There you go. Yeah. And this book, I'm particularly happy with this book because uh, several reasons, two reasons, I would say. First, this is a summary of the knowledge accumulated worldwide. It's not only my studies, not at all. I did not favor much at all. I wanted to have somewhere, this, I read 3,700 papers. I collected 3,700 papers on the Barnard only. And uh, I collected these papers during 25 years, yeah. one after the other. This, I read all of them. And the, the second reason why I'm very proud, because, okay, the text is easy to read. For, it's not for academics, huh? for, for ornithologists, naturalists. And I have a friend of mine who took five years to paint a lot of paintings. Thus, I wanted to combine science with art. Yeah. And it's full of paintings, full of drawings, fantastic drawings. And thus, this is really... I think that people will, some will love, everybody will love the paintings, of course. Yeah, they're but, they are beautiful. Yeah. But some will, will, will just, just want the book for the paintings. And if this is the case, I'm very happy because this is very important to, to talk to the heart of the people, not only the science, the dry matter, but the, the heart. Yeah. yeah, but and I think it's also got so much value. I mean, my copy's only just arrived, so I'm, I've only had a chance to flick through it, but I have yeah. got a copy. And, and what I'll do is I'll put in the comments, I'll put a link to where people can buy it in the UK if they want yeah. it. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no problem at all. Um, but it's, it's because the barn owl is one of those species that everyone's interested in. It, you know, there's so many species of birds of prey you know, that some people love them, so sparrowhawks, some people love them, some people hate them because they eat their birds in their back garden or common buzzards. Yeah. Some farmers don't mind them, other farmers can't stand them. But then when you get to barn owls, everyone loves barn owls. I, I, you know, obviously, unless there's a specific cultural reason that owls are built omen, but people love barn owls. And yeah, it, it, so it's, it's great to have a book that, anyone can read like you say you you've yeah. done all the hard work of understanding all the f scientific papers and then yeah d dummies like me can read a book and yeah it's been cypher yeah, yeah it, that's it's brilliant and, may, and maybe i can tell you the the most fascinating result mm -hmm. because you know it's 3700 but i'm sorry if this is one of my paper but it's not because of this because yeah. we, we we just had one idea at some point and i thought what is crazy because at some point I wondered why the banal is white. In the UK, they are very white. Yes. And I never thought about this, why the banal is white. This is so, it seems stupid, you know? It's a nocturnal bird. The prey should notice the banal from very far. And mainly mm -hmm. when there is the full moon with the light, when you go out with the full moon, you see the banal say, wow, it's like a, like a star, you know? Yeah. Uh, in the, in the, in the, at night. 
And why it is white? One of the reasons it's because with the, the light of the full moon, it reflects against the feathers. And the rodents, when they see the barn owl with this light, it's like a flash light and they panic. And yes. they, are, they are panicking so much that they freeze, they stay immobile very long and the barn owl can capture them very easily. Thus, this is the only the single nocturnal predator which found the trick to use the light of the moon to scare the rodents. And that's why it is white. Okay, because that's, that's a question that's been, I, I used to work with birds of prey in captivity and, and every now and then you get asked, I mean, I love it. I, lo I prefer it when people ask you questions that you don't know because then it gives you something to work. I mean, as a scientist, you, that's all science is about. You're always finding out, you don't know. The more you know, the less you know, really. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, the, the yeah, I used to get asked that by people, and I've heard all sorts of all sorts of ones hypotheses or ideas, and I think that can't be true. You know, I'll I'll make you laugh with this one. One gentleman once told me he was doing a talk on owls, and he's he was telling people that barn owls were white because before barns were invented, they used to live on the the white cliffs of Dover was where they where they were found. So they were camouflaged against the cliff. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? Are, well, people were in awe of that sort of thing. But yeah, it's nice to know the scientists out there like yourself. Yeah, yeah. Because we did some experiments. Huh? This was a very long uh, work, very long, very long. Yeah. We put GPS on the barn owls. We 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 know everything, and every 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 result goes in this direction. But we use the the light of the the moon. Brilliant. So going back to the project in, in the Middle East then, how many nest yeah. boxes roughly are you are, uh, are in, in the... In, in Israel, there are 4,000 nest boxes, right. which is a lot. Yeah. In Palestine, it, it fluctuates because we, we are starting to, re, to to start again the project to, to, to bring more money in Palestine. There are 200 about, and uh, Jordan, three 400 nest okay. boxes. Brilliant. And you know, this is not easy in, uh, in the Arab world, mainly because, for several reasons, but one of the, the key reasons is because the people are very scared by burnouts. They think this is a bad omen, brings mm -hmm. bad luck, which was the case in, in, uh, in our countries uh, in the past, but mm -hmm. we totally changed the, the mind. This, uh, but when we talk with the people, after 10 minutes, they understand and they say, okay, okay. We, yeah. And they start to love burnouts. And that's that's you educating them about the benefits of barn owls predating rodents and and obviously protecting crops and so on and so yeah. so yeah. forth. Um, brilliant. Did you just out of interest because I'm, I'm lucky enough to spend time monitoring barn owls in the UK? Uh, did you find with nest boxes the was there a lack of nest sites, or so did the owls readily take to the boxes? Or what, what's the, what was the situation uh, with that? Uh, uh, that's what I explained in the book. The, 50 years ago in, in Europe, they were breeding, most of the pairs were breeding in houses, in the churches. Once the, the, the people started to fix nest boxes, they abandoned these sites and they all breed in nest boxes. And I think one of the reasons, because the nest boxes, we fix them at the right place, mm -hmm. fewer predators. And also because the design is very good for the barn owls. Thus, this is like a hotel for them. And that's why they prefer the nest boxes. And uh, in the Middle East, we fix the boxes in the middle of the fields. Mm -hmm. And they could not breed in the middle of the fields without nest boxes. Thus, we yeah. open new, this new, just new nest sites for them. And as long as there is yeah. food, they come in the box. Sure. They take to it, yeah. Yeah. No, I. Yeah. I mean, the reason I asked that is because I've got a friend who, um, based out in America in North Carolina, and, and when she came over to the UK, I took her out and we checked some nest barn owl boxes, and they just started a, a nest box scheme for barn owls in in North Carolina. This was, and when she went back and after their first breeding season, I, I forget how many nest boxes they put up but she was telling me their occupancy rate and it was phenomenal. It was something like out of say, however many boxes they put up, say a hundred boxes, they had like an 80% uptake. But 80? It was because, yeah, wow. but it was, it was because there was no nest, there was loads of prey, 
but there was no nest sites for the bar for barn owls. So as soon as they said we were putting boxes up, barn owls were taken to them straight away. And it was incredible well, to hear. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. But we, we don't have not 80 percent occupied yeah. in Switzerland now, but the kestrel go in the nest box as well. Yes. Just, uh, and, and in some years there are few barn because the population size fluctuates a lot in the barn, much more than in the kestrel, for instance. Just in some years they can have very few pairs, and the year after the best year ever. Just it, it can really increase, decrease very sharply, very quickly. Yeah. So, are you finding then that that you're having a, in terms of the landowners and the farmers from the Palestinians and Jordanians and so on, are they they're working really well together then over this project? They're quite supportive. You, you mean the Israeli with the Palestinians, for instance? Yeah. yeah. Yes, but the, okay. The yeah, sure, sure, sure. But the problem now. There are several problems. The first one is that the Israeli cannot go in Palestine anymore. The second is that the Palestinians, they, they, it's difficult for them to come in Israel. It's not easy. And the third, the other reason it's it's more intric intricate because, you know, as, as soon as one Palestinian starts to work with Israeli, the friends, they, they, they might not like it. Right. And also if they get money from you know, from the, the Europeans or the Americans for the banners, they can be jealous. Thus, you know, you have to consider all these human relationships. And yeah, it's yeah. Not, not necessarily easy. And it depends on the people, just on the people. But uh, we have yeah. good friends, you know, with the Pope, we, we had one Palestinian with us, who came with us, and with the Jordanian as well, and the Israeli. Just there were the, the three communities were there with the Pope. But oh, yeah. we cannot tell the name of the Palestinian because it's dangerous for him. Oh, wow. Wow, just this is really yeah, it's not easy it's not easy but yeah. you know we are like marathonians we we are ups and down but we continue to 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 run and we have yeah. we never stop <laughs> right i mean it's great to i mean the reason i ask you that as well because it's quite funny here in the in the in the area that i monitor barn owl boxes it's almost like the farmers here it's a bit of a bit of comp they're competitive in some ways you'll often go to a farm and they might have say three three barn owl boxes on their land and they they obviously know when they see an owl coming and going from a box and they'll say they'll say oh how many how many chicks have i got and you when you check in the box you say oh you've got four this year oh brilliant and then they'll be like well <laughs> How, how many has so and so got next door? And you'll be like, oh well, they haven't got any barn owls in their boxes this year. And they're like, yes, good. That's right. That's because they're back. And they don't. They mean well by it, but it is. It's almost no. like a competition. That, that these are my owls. I I look after the land sure, and for the sure. owls' benefit. They, they, they love them. They love the barn owls. And what we do now, I receive some uh, grants to to communicate with the farmers because we are working with the barn owls and the farmers, by the way, for 30 years already. Yeah. And now we are producing material to, to tell to the farmers in your box, since 30 years, you had this number of chicks and we ring these chicks and this chick went to France, went to Germany and yeah. we put GPS and we show them where they hunt, you know, at night, etc. Just we need to, to communicate more with the farmers and that's what, what we do. Oh, brilliant. So what is, it, it, that's obviously part of the future. What else have you got planned for the, for the project um, going forwards? Okay, the, okay, there are several uh, avenues. The first one is research. I'm doing research for many years. I was interested in everything, you know, divorce. Uh, and one of the main topics was, as I said before, the family interactions mm -hmm. within the family. And the second one was the function of this color polymorphism, red, white, full of spots, immaculate, spotless. And, um, and now we started with the GPS. We put uh, GPS on 400 banals already, you know, in, in a couple of years. Yeah, every year, wow. 100 banals with GPS. Because we know exactly what they do. And, you know, it's like you open a, a, a door which was locked during 100 yeah. years. And you open the door, say, "Wow, my God, they, they do this! Say, wow, it's crazy, you know." And uh, this is for for us. We are like kids. Suddenly, we 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 discover new things we had no yeah. idea about. And thus, this is the one of line of research with this GPS to understand how they forage. 
The second one is this um, education communication. We need to be more to, to spend more time. And usually researchers, you know, the academy, they, they don't wa waste in brackets time. And that's why I decided now we have to do it. We have to, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. Another issue is what we were talking about, the human bird relationship. We, I started some projects with psychologists as well to understand our people at the worldwide scale, how they, they view the, the, the owls, how they, yeah. what is the attitude, the beliefs with, with, uh, with the owls. That's we are working. We started some project on this and to see whether the ornithologists have some impact on the farmers, you know, by going every day to the, to the farms to talk about birds, what are our impact. Another issue is the Middle East, the peace thing, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And um, just if you want, I'm a bird lover. I spend my life with birds and I shift a little bit by reconsidering human, if you want. <laughs> because I was, uh, you know, forgetting that we are humans, where I was interested in birds. But I think we yeah. need to bring together nature and humans so that we will protect nature much more. We have to convince the people. And as an academist, I should be more interested in statistics, all this stuff. But now, as you, as you will see with the book, I'm doing more with artists. And I'm producing a, a comics with, about the banal. I'm working for, on it for already two years. Wow, it's huge work. And I have 100 pages with uh, jokes, you know, about to bring the, the, the banal, the knowledge on the banal to the kids. I mean, the kids from oh, seven years to 70, 77 years, of course. And uh, I'm writing books <laughs> for, for lay public as well. I just finished one. I wrote in French because the language has to be very easy and I will translate it in English soon. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it don't, it's never been more important, I don't think. And well, to, to sort of get more and more people. And the, the barn owl, the barn owl wins hands down, doesn't it? I, I always... Yeah. I always use the barn owl as a as a way of unlocking a door. If I if I know I'm going to say I, there's an area that I want to study, and it might not be to do with barn owls, it might be peregrines or buzzards yeah. or something like that. Um, but I know a barn owl will always unlock the unlock the door, so to speak. So you go in with sure. with that, and then and then you win people over, and you gain their trust, and then you can work with them on other things that they originally they might not have been. Well, they'd have shut the door in your face if you'd have gone yeah. straight in there. But but barn owls open doors. Yeah, they're brilliant. That's an ambassador, the barn owl. The ambassador not only in the Middle East for peace but also with the people. And uh, if the Pope is interested in the banal, people, everybody should be interested in the banal, I think. That's, uh, yeah. that's, that's yeah. my message. The banal interests everybody on earth. Yeah, absolutely. You maybe just the need queen, to get maybe. The maybe you, yeah, the queen, the queen, queen exactly. The queen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's meet at uh, uh, Winchester. Yeah, get to, get to Buckingham Palace. And, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. She hasn't got yeah, yeah. She won't be that busy at the moment, so yeah, you'll be you'll be yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Someone, someone's um. Oh, I don't. Roy, Roy Lee, Sam Lee's asked a question. I don't know if you know. I think Roy's emailed you before now. Um, but he's asked, how long do the GPS tags last? Uh, it depends how many data point location you get per minutes. We get one location every second. And on the GPS, we, we also have an accelerometer, which gives you indication about how the barn owl moves. Just you even yeah. know if they feed, if they eat, because the head does like this. You know yeah. how many wing flappings they do per second. Just you, you, wow. you have all this information. And now we want to put, to add um, light sensor. You know, with this moon story, we want to know the light conditions. Thus, if we get all this data, we can um, have data for 10 nights. Right, and okay. We, and, and, you know, the, the idea is not to get data for six months with two birds. Yeah. We prefer to have 100 birds, 10 days, so that we can look at the variation in behavior and how yeah. this variation relates to traits like sex, body mass, size, and color, plumage coloration, all this stuff.
Brilliant. And have you, so have you started put this GPS, how long have you been doing the GPS work for now? Is that, have you published? Uh, for uh, four years. We did not publish uh, a very uh, a few results with the moon story. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we did not yet publish because our philosophy is to get a lot of data, big samples, and then to publish. Just, you know, sometimes yeah. I wait 10 years, you know, and I don't mind. I prefer to wait a long time, but to do very good research. That's, that's our philosophy, yeah. how we work. But my PhD students, are the first one is finishing, and we are writing papers. The, the, the studies should go out soon. And by the way, yeah. we are working on the UK. You, do, you don't know this, of course, because it's not okay. published. We came in the UK, in England, and uh, Ireland as well to get samples yeah. of on dead, dead uh, birds found along the, the highways. And we want to understand when the banal arrived in the UK. And R is the, you know, the genetic uh, constitution of the population. Yeah. And whether, from where they colonized Ireland, and yeah. whether the banals are more related to the French or the, the Portuguese, all this stuff. And if okay. you experience some bottlenecks, you know, a crash of banal population, Increase again, crash, all this stuff. Yeah. Yes, we are working on the on the UK birds as well. Okay, brilliant. This this is not this this hasn't got anything to do with Brexit, has it? And that if you find that barn owls are oh, related, it, they get they, they're out. It, de <laughs> it depends on the results. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I shouldn't have brought Brexit into that. That was a serious conversation. Then apologies. <laughs> um, that's my that's my crap British humour. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that's brilliant. Well, I'd I'd love to hear some more more about that um, as as it as it occurs. Yeah, I think we're 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 really lucky here in Britain with the, with the bar now. It's a, it's a wonderful. I'm going to make you jealous now. Then you, you're talking about this. I'll try and make you jealous anyway, um, because we, I live on a a, a a small farm, family farm, and the barn owls. I think we're we're going to have a good year for barn owls this year in. in Britain because it seemed it seems like a good vole year. Our lawn was covered in uh, short-tailed field vole holes quite early on, and I've got a little dog that is obsessed with trying to catch them. And it, it, it yeah, we went into overdrive early on this year. Anyway, we've we've got a pair of barn owls that are nesting in our box about probably about 300 meters from where I'm sat now. So so most most nights I can go and sit in the back field and watch the male. And he does the same thing. He flies out the box to the woodland, spends about five minutes, and then he comes down the same hedgerow and then goes off, goes off hunting and we the other night I took my wife out and we sat underneath an oak tree and the barn owl came down. And this is what's wonderful about them. My wife's not, she's interested in wildlife, but she's not obsessed with it like, like yeah. I am. Um, and the barn owl flew around and landed and literally right above us for about, well, 10, 10 meters above us max. And he looked at us, had a rouse, and then off he went. And he wasn't bothered in it. Yeah, it was, wow. uh, it, that's the sort of thing that stays with you, isn't it? That's the wonderful thing about barn owls. You were looking very nice to the barn owl, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably, I, I look like a mouse, maybe that's the yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, so, we're, so we're very lucky at the moment to have the, have the barn owls in the nest box uh, behind the house. So, uh, so yeah. Um, Tell me then, what's I, I always ask these stupid questions with with people when I've got them on, and I'll ask things like, "What's the most incredible experience?" But apart from the Pope, what's what what's one of your big? What are you really proud of? What's what's one achievement wow. that you're really proud of, if you can? Oh la la, la la. Well, beyond the um, beyond the Middle East, I think. Maybe the Middle East one, one very short story. I was walking yeah. in, in the in the in the mountains last year, and suddenly I received a phone call, and this was a Palestinian. I said, "Wow!" I did not know him at all. I have no idea. And he he, he say, "Are you Alex?" Say, yeah, I'm Alex. Yeah, hello, hello. You know, uh, I have a box of uh, for a banner in my garden. I say, "Wow, great, fantastic!" And uh, can I be of any help? No, 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 but the panel is in my garden. I can see it. And I just wanted to tell you, the, the panel is here in my garden. 
And, you know, the guy from Palestine just calling me just to tell me that he had a Barnard in his garden. I said, Brilliant. wow, wow. If there is a measure of success to me, it was, wow, much more than the Pope, you know, the Palestinian who calls you yeah. just to tell you that he has a Barnard. It was, uh, yeah. it was really moving. But apart from this, I would say that maybe what I'm more proud of is that probably because uh, I have a team of young people working and they are yeah. so brilliant, so brilliant. You know, I worked myself alone during 20 years about, and then I said, okay, go, you do the field work. And they are so clever. And this is really nice to work with young people fascinated with the panel. I don't tell them you should go to work, you know, how many hours. Yeah. And I say nothing. And they work day and night, crazy, totally crazy. And they, they bring new ideas. Plus this is good to, to be in contact with these people. And also, yeah. To have been in contact with 200 farmers, I learned how to behave with people because of the banal. Because you have to be in contact with all these farmers, you have to learn yeah. to drink, you know, some alcohol with them to, <laughs> to to be able to do all to convince them to to fix a, a box. You know, 30 years ago it was not the same situation as now. You had really yeah. convinced them to do this. Thus, this is the human contact, maybe which I'm more proud. And I think the banal is. Um, is uh, possible to do this because they breed in farms. If I would have worked yeah. with Tony Arles, I would be just lost in the middle of the forest. And I would not Wouldn't be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Just, no, yeah. I, I mean, that's really nice to hear because that, that sort of echoes my thoughts. And when I go out and do talks, it reminds me I've got, there's a picture that I've got that I include in my talk. And it's of, of the actually I was when I was telling you about the com competitive side of farmers, it was it was this farmer I was thinking of Bert, his name is. Um, and it, he was there. I've got a picture of Bert um, with his with his grandson and his grandson's his grandson isn't really he was out putting up a fence for the cattle, I think, and he called him over and and, they, and he, he really didn't want to hold the owl. He was really shy. He's, and he, Anyway, he did. And I've got this great, lovely picture of, of them and because yeah. like so, Bert, so, so proud to have barn owls and passionate about it. And, yeah. and it's interesting to hear what you say about alcohol because I'm a farmer's son and so I know all about cups of tea and alcohol when you go to, <laughs> go to farms. <laughs> But, but it must be a universal sure. thing because we you know, had, I, we I, had I, well, sure. I was once, just going to say, was, we had Gar Gareth. Go on, sorry. After you. Yeah. I remember one, one time, it was, I was young, 18 years old, I think, and the farmer asked me, do you want a bit of very tough alcohol, very strong? And I said, no. Ten years later, he said, ah, you, you, you don't drink, huh? It was 10 years later, and I learned yeah. ne never refuse, never refuse. If somebody <laughs> offers you something, you, you have to accept, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a farmer's son, and and uh, yeah, one thing my my dad's struggling with at the moment is the fact that the pubs are closed, so he can't go for a pint after he's finished work. He doesn't like, he doesn't like that. Yeah. But it's funny because we we had, I was just going to say, we had Gareth, Dr. Gareth Tate from the Endangered Wildlife Trust in South Africa on, and he was telling me a story the other day about they're doing a, a project on martial eagles out in the Karoo. And he says, you'll go out to these farms because they're dealing with pre a conflict between martial eagles taking lambs and the farmers, because they're not used to seeing anyone out there. It's the middle of nowhere. <laughs> they he said, they give us their keys to their house and say, yeah, go in, make yourself comfortable. There's, there's yeah. beer in the fridge, help yourself. <laughs> so that, obviously, oh. obviously it's a, a universal thing with farmers that yeah. you, you've yeah, got yeah, to, yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's, and that's maybe good. maybe a, a, a very last thing is that I realized in the last years is that people, anyone, as you said, is interested in the barn owl and yeah. to learn how, what to present to the people, to fascinate them. And, you know, as uh, I'm working in the university, you know, usually the academics, they, they come with the very last results they've got. And they are sure that they are the most fascinating. They are so complex. Nobody understands anything. Thus, we have to come to the roots and to explain to the people the daily life of the birds. And this is one thing, uh, that's why I'm so interested to write books for lay public, to fascinate the people. And we have to talk to the heart of the people so that they are more keen to protect nature. 
and I'm not yeah. sure and I'm sure that we we need art we need these communication skills we need to love people as well like with the farmers yeah. and I think if we have all this we can do something for the future well let me let me ask one more question if you wouldn't mind because yeah. I get asked this a lot when I when and, and you you're one of the perfect candidates to ask this to I get asked a lot by academics but also general public and people you know who, who've just got an interest in birds of prey and they they say they ask me how do I how do I get into monitoring or or understanding birds of prey and my stock answer well what what would you say to someone who asks you asked you just a simple question like that you, you mean if if somebody would like to participate in monitoring well, just, what you yeah what's, what's your advice to someone who not necessarily your project but someone who's got an interest in birds of prey but they've got no ornithological uh, background they just want to do I something think, i think they should find people who are doing it close to their home and there are always somebody who is doing it a group of people mm -hmm and to get friends around this and then to have a team of people and uh, i'm sure they are you know the ornithologists usually they are looking for people to help to you know more eyes yeah. to follow the birds this, they should just look for groups of people like in your county with five groups of people working with the barn owls and to join forces to to protect nature and i'm sure they, they will accept them no problem yeah 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 that's that's what I, I was going to say. That's my answer to them is just to encourage them to actually get out there and do it. You know, it's so so many people say, "Oh, I want to do this," and they, they they're a bit worried about yeah. for one reason or another. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or if they don't find anybody, they just buy binoculars and they start by themselves. Most ornithologists started by themselves alone. Of course, it mm -hmm. takes time, and at some point, you meet people and you you start to build a, a team. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, someone someone's just commented. Uh, Emma's just commented saying she's got your book. The artwork is beautiful, and she can't wait to start reading it. So, so thank there you go. You. You've, definitely you. so, you've definitely sold one book in the UK. So there you go. That's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> two, Great. Two, two with me actually. Sure. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank I'm you. sure you'll sell a few more off the back of this. Right, Alex. Um, I won't keep you. Any, I'll, I'll end the video now. It's been a it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you very much for your time. Me too. Thank you. We've got, and, uh, we've got lots of things to talk about. Good, but, goodbye uh, to all yeah. my UK friends. <laughs>